Sean Cook's Newsmaker Saturday starts now. Thanks for joining us for Newsmaker Saturday. We will talk with Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb about the border crisis later in the program, but we begin with Congressman Debbie Lesko, a Republican who's represented Arizona's 8th District since 2018. These are the suburbs north and west of Phoenix in the district that includes several retirement communities, including Sun City West. Congressman, thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, John. This is this is a tough week because we had another school shooting. This one in Nashville killed six. And I know you're a strong advocate of the Second Amendment. Whenever these shootings happen, reflexively, the, the discussion turns to gun control. Do you think that there is any middle ground on this? I, I think, I mean, honestly, if we're... We've got more guns than people in this country. It strikes me that the only way we would ever get at this is actually revisiting the Second Amendment, and I don't see that happening. I don't see uh, any negotiations on gun control. I do think there's a breakdown in our society of values, and I think that's contributing to it. Um, people don't value life as much. Um, there's a lot of uh, political angst going on, a lot of polarization. Half the country thinks one way, the other half of the country thinks another way. And I think it's leading to some of these school shootings. Um, we have to get back to, uh, quite frankly, moral values and that life uh, matters and you just can't go around shooting and killing people. This is obviously uh, devastating and we keep seeing all of these school shootings, but I don't think putting more laws on law abiding citizens is going to solve the problem. Well, the interesting thing in this case, again, is is there was a lack of somebody being there as a deterrent. A lot of people say you've got to have some layer of protection at the school. You've got to, you've got to have um, probably somebody armed at these schools to provide a deterrent effect to somebody who wants to do harm to staff or kids. Well, I totally agree with you. And I remember when there was a push in uh, my school district, the Peoria Unified School District, to have more resource officers. But then there was this whole movement recently nationwide to get rid of uh, school resource officers because they thought they were too authoritative and we'd be too disruptive to the children. Well, obviously, I think the school district there that um, yeah, and other school districts that got rid of school resource officers Phoenix Unified. Are, are regretting it now. Yeah, Phoenix Unified went through that same same issue. One more thing before we move on from guns. There also seems to be a breakdown in law abiding people. I mean, this person purchased these guns legally. But we also find out that this person was being treated for mental illness as well. So the guns are purchased legally, but mental illness either comes on or it's not detected at the time of buying the gun or maybe it manifests later. What do we do about that? Because there always seems to be this mental health component in these shootings. This is very complicated, very um, difficult to navigate. When I was in the state legislature, we tried to navigate some gun issues with um, constables, constables that were asked to take away people's guns out of their home because of you know different violations they had, whether it's domestic violence um, uh, reasons or not. But it's very, I found out very quickly that there's not an easy fix and there's always these problems but I want to continue working on it because there are laws already in place about which people should not have guns and we need to do a better job of enforcing that and also figure out how we can help all of these people that have mental illness. That's the one thing that I have supported and I think most Republicans support is more funding for mental health treatments. Republicans are in the majority now. I'm sure that's a that's a nice position for you to be in. There's a lot of discussion about the family, the Biden family business dealings. Um, there are allegations of influence peddling lawmakers on House oversight have bank documents now that show that the president's son, Hunter Biden, brother Jim, Hallie Biden, who was the widow of the president's late son, Bo, got, uh, got money, a sizable amounts of money from Hunter's business dealings. Where is this all leading? 
Uh, influence peddling, as I understand it, it's, it's the, the graft of Washington, but it's not illegal. So what do you do about this if this is proven true? Well, we're doing a lot of investigations here in the U.S. House of Representatives, and obviously that is one of them. And I think we're just trying to get to the truth of the whole thing. It's And, and also, we're the American public, about half of the country, is very upset that it seems to be a double standard, right? And so with the media, a lot of the media doesn't talk about the uh, Biden family and how they were paid money. And so we want to expose that so the American public understand what happened. And then if there's any uh, le legalities that were violated, then we can pursue that. But can you do that without revisiting President Trump's family? Ivanka Trump, China trademarks, Jared Kushner's deals with the Saudis, some of the Trump hotel deals. Can you do one without the other and call it fair play? Well, I think the Democrats have been in charge for four years and they impeached President Trump twice. So I think they have had their time to go after President Trump uh, and and do everything and anything they can, as you see right now, and New York DA is going after him again. And so the Democrats have had their chance with, with President Trump and, um, you know, so I wouldn't say it's been ignored. Since you're mentioning President Trump, I've got to ask you, I mean, he is now, in, in most of the polling, still the odds-on favorite to win the Republican nomination. I understand we're a long ways away from that. Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea if he were the party's standard bearer? Boy, I'm not going to answer that. It's too early <laughs> on. Not? I don't know who's all going to run. I don't know who's going to run. One thing I have to say about President Trump is he has proven himself as an effective leader. A lot of great things got done for America, like helping to secure the border, making us energy independent. Um, but, you know, I don't know if uh, who's all getting in to this, uh, you know, competition. So I'm going to reserve uh, my opinion until I find out who's all getting into the field. Okay, you've had some, some time to reflect on the pandemic and how we handled that. Do you want to offer up some opinions on, on where we failed and, and where we need to look forward um, for the next one, which is inevitable? Yeah, I'm on the select subcommittee to investigate COVID. So our first hearing, we investigated the origins of COVID and how we believe China has hid information and how there were some assumptions made or you know, put forward that may have not been true, like it, that it was natural origin. And the people that said, oh, we think it's from the lab, were silenced. So we learned from that that we cannot silence people with opposing viewpoints. The hearing that we had earlier today dealt with the ramifications of school closures. And what we learned from the witnesses were there many countries in the European uh, nations that didn't close the schools. Sweden they kept comes the to mind. schools open yep. and they didn't have um, a, a big problem with kids getting COVID or spreading it to their teachers. Yeah, I think there's no doubt. One final thing. Well, I guess we're, we're running short of time. Climate change seems to be driving the Democrat agenda. All, almost all roads lead back to climate change. Just give me your sense of where we are on that issue. Well, Republicans have a bill called H.R. 1. It's our number one priority bill that we will be passing out of the U.S. House of Representatives this Thursday. It will unleash American-made energy and do some permitting reform so we can get all of the above energy projects done, whether they're natural gas projects, uh, nuclear projects, renewable projects. We're too slow in our country, and we need to excel in energy and lead the world. Any chance that passes in the Senate if it, if it moves on? And the, and the president wouldn't sign it, I'm almost certain. Well, you know, I think there's a possibility. We've heard um, from Steve Scalise that the, some Democrats are going to support it in the U.S. House of Representatives. So we're already talking to senators, and we have senators that are going to push it uh, over in the Senate. So you never know. We're going to keep pushing for the American people because our gasoline prices have gone up 51 percent. 
Our energy prices have gone up 41% since Biden's taken office. And so Republicans want to reduce the cost of gasoline and energy, and HR1 will do that. Congresswoman Debbie Lesko, thank you for being with us on Newsmaker Saturday. Good to see you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up next, Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb on the crisis at the southern border and his opinions of Alejandro Mayorkas. He's had personal interaction with the Secretary of Homeland Security. That's next on Newsmaker Saturday. Welcome back to Newsmaker Saturday. The immigration crisis at the southern border has received a lot of attention. Record numbers of people crossing illegally over the past two years. And Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb has seen the spillover effects in his county. Sheriff Lamb joins me now. Good to see you. How are you? I'm doing great, John. Good to see you, too. I, I know we were talking about this, but it was seven years ago yesterday that I first came on your Newsmaker show. So thanks yeah, for having that, me back. That seems impossible. I have no. to say at the outset, um, my deepest condolences to you and your family, the loss of your son, Cooper, and his fiance Caroline, and your granddaughter in that horrific car accident uh, where a speeding driver hit them. Mark, I, I don't know how you've gotten through this. I really don't. Well, John, I appreciate that. And I, we are so grateful to not just our community, but the entire state of Arizona. We've just received so much love and support. And on a, honestly, if it wasn't for our faith in God and Jesus Christ and, and, and in a life after this, we'd probably be in a much different place. But uh, we're just so grateful for the prayers and the support. And I, so I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Yeah, we, we've been thinking of you, Sheriff. Okay, let's get to the issue of immigration for a minute. You testified before Congress, I believe it was the end of February. You were flanked by a mother who had lost two sons, I think, to, a fent to fentanyl overdoses. What were you trying to tell Congress that day? What was your, what was your overarching message? I think the overarching message, and first of all, my heart went out to that mother and to all the mothers and fathers and families who have lost loved ones to the fentanyl poisonings. I, I thought her testimony was very powerful. The testimony I wanted to give was real facts on the boots ground, firsthand um, numbers and experiences of what we are dealing with here in Arizona. And that this is about human trafficking and drug trafficking into America and getting Congress to really understand just how this is impacting not just families in Arizona, but families across this country. Because the ultimate thing was what happens in my backyard today will be in their front yard tomorrow. These numbers are really interesting because in January and February, we had about 129,000 border encounters. Now, that's a lot, people trying to cross illegally. But it's about half of what we had in December simply because the Biden administration made a policy change. Basically, Mexico would take back Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans under pandemic-era rules, denying migrants entry based on COVID-19 restrictions. And the number of migrants plunged by about half. It strikes me, I guess the bottom line is, there are things we can do just policy-wise to stem this. Am I, am I missing something? No, you're absolutely spot on, John. We can make some simple changes within these policies and we will see a, a, a significant difference. You just said there was a big difference between January and February as opposed to December just by enforcing Title 42. The problem we're now facing is they're talking about removing Title 42. It's going to go away. And when that does, don't think that the cartels won't take advantage of that and just flood our communities, flood our borders with more and more people from all over the world, not just from Mexico or from Central America. They are coming from all over the world. Yeah, that's going to end in May. I mean, uh, ostensibly it's going to end in May, although the Biden administration may be rethinking some of this because if President Biden decides to run for a second term, this issue has become a never-ending thorn in his side. What they've done is they've honestly just ignored it, John. Um, we just have not had a lot of communication with the federal government uh, since we they took over. I've had my first interaction with uh, Secretary Mayorkas the other day. We were able to sit down a one-on-one. -on -one. He and I were able to talk about, first of all, some personal issues on this. You know, he, he wrote me a handwritten note uh, 
when my son and my granddaughter died, but then we were able to talk about the border issues, how it's impacting me, even though I'm not even a border county, what we can do to help them achieve their mission in securing our communities, securing our border, and ending this border crisis. But I would say that they've just really turned a blind eye to it, and they've left the Border Patrol agents, the ICE agents, the CBP agents holding a very difficult task which has basically become glorified babysitting from the amount of people coming in here. And they will continue to come as long as these weak policies uh, stay, in, uh, stay in existence. And I don't see them changing under this administration. Sheriff, you, you bring up a really interesting point. I think, it, I think our viewers would be fascinated by this. Mayorkas has been really demonized by folks on the right that he is, you know, they're trying to impeach him, as you know, for failing to secure that border. So you have a real one-on-one -on -one with him. Is he to blame or is he simply the messenger of what the Biden administration wants and he is essentially, without resigning, powerless to do much about it? That is a great question, John. And uh, first of all, I was very, he's a good guy. He's a good man. I mean, I, I think whenever you get a chance to meet one-on-one, -on -one, you really start to understand the humanity of the different sides. And what we tried to do was find common ground and not try to find the areas where we disagree with things. We were very open and honest with each other that we disagreed. I say the border is unsecure. I know that he has said that the border is secure, but I do believe that this is really the Biden administration that has failed the American people. Now, to some extent, when you are the Secretary of Homeland Security, it becomes your job to tell the president what is wrong and what is right and what are the proper things to do. Do you think and he's you doing hold that? To the Things if you know what's to do, and let him pay the price if they don't work. But I think uh, I think there's some some responsibility on both ends. But ultimately, it always falls to the to the president because this is his administration. So you think Mayorkas, if it were simply left up to him, might be treating this differently? I mean, do you think he understands that when he says the border is secure, it demonstrably is not? No, I think he understands that uh, th there are statistics that do not support that. I have been very outward to say that that just is untrue. I can show you all the statistics that say the border is not secure. He also has a double-edged sword. If he says the border is not secure, how do his employees feel? Maybe they feel like he's saying that he's not. They're not doing a good job. If he says it's unsecure. That, I mean, they may say that he's not doing a good job if he says it's unsecure. If he says it's secure, then he has to face the music that he's facing now. Look, I think he's a good man put in a very tough position by this administration. I would like to see him do some different things. And I was able to talk to him about the things that I think we need to see different. Was he open to it? I think he's open to it, but he is definitely no shrinking violent. He is a, a tough man. I mean, I don't think you can be weak and be in those positions in politics. I hope that his recent visit to here to Arizona, his recent meeting with me, helps him kind of uh, help us attack these issues that we're facing, which are human slavery and uh, drug trafficking into this country. When people see these images of groups, large groups, just coming in almost unchecked across the border, I think there's still this, uh, <laughs> I do, I, I think, Okay, why is this happening and what is the goal? After you talk to Mayorkas, if you want an open border, is it simply a humanitarian perspective that we're a big country, we're a welcoming country, if people are in strife and they want to come here, we should let them come in? Is it as simple as that? Is it we think that they're future voters? What, what, is, what is it? What's driving the policy? Well, I don't think it's as simple as that. I think it is have to do with getting more voters, changing the culture, changing what America is. You know, Joe Biden is one of his, his promises two years ago said he wanted to reinvent America. Um, they're definitely reinventing it. What are you seeing on the ground in Pinal County? Because a lot of these people, I have friends who work at the airport who watch flights. And one of my friends said a lot of them are going to Newark and to New York. Uh, flights packed with immigrants. They've got their papers. They've got all of their stuff. They're ready to go. So it's not that they're necessarily staying in Arizona, they're moving on. What do you see in Pinal County? John, that's, that's a great point. And I've said this all along, we are a pass through county. So some of it stays, but the majority of it is passing through. We are 71 miles off the border where the I-10 intersects with Pan uh, Pinal County. We are 52 miles off the border where it intersects in the desert area on the Tonotum Reservation. 
So we are not right on the border. What we get is we get the cartels trafficking humans and drugs, which is their product, right through the heart of our county on the I-10 interstate. So what we've seen is a 377% increase in traffic stops involving human smuggling and trafficking. We have seen a 461% increase in the last two years of pursuits involving human smuggling, uh, human smuggling and trafficking. We have seen a 610% increase over the last two years in fentanyl seizures in our county. So these are the biggest problems that we're having. And obviously it's having an effect on American lives because fentanyl poisonings has become the leading cause of death amongst Americans now, between the ages of 45. True or false, a lot of the people you're stopping who are involved in smuggling are Americans. That's absolutely true. The majority of the kid, the drivers that we're stopping are Americans. Um, the cartels aren't dumb. They're recruiting Americans, predominantly youth, because they know that the law is a lot more lenient with the youth. So they're getting these kids that are 16, 17, as young as 14, driving down to the border in mom or dad's car or somebody else's car, maybe even a stolen car. They're picking these illegals up, getting paid $1,000 per person sometimes. And then they are driving these people back through counties like Pinal County up to Phoenix, where they will then be distributed throughout the rest of the country. Okay, let's move on to politics for a minute. There's been talk, and you put some stuff out on Twitter a couple of months ago, that you're kicking around running for U.S. Senate. Where are you on that decision? Well, I'm very seriously considering it. We are very close to making a decision. My wife, obviously, look, politics is not fun. This is not a decision you make easily and lightly. Um, they drag you, your family, and everybody through the mud along with them. Um, but it's something I think that we need good people to represent the state of Arizona. When we look at the horizon and we look at where we're at as a state, we think we can do better. And uh, so we've been spending a lot of time praying about it, thinking about it, and uh, we're very close to making a decision, but we are absolutely seriously considering it. Ultimately, my goal is to represent, would be to represent the people of Arizona, protect their constitutional rights, uh, to increase their day, their their quality of life, um, and to restore God, family, and freedom into politics in this country. If Kerry Lake were to run for U.S. Senate in Arizona, there are rumors about that. Would you back off, or would you continue on? You know, if I were to do it, I would feel I would do it because I feel compelled to do it. And when you feel compelled to do it, it's hard to pump the brakes at that point. You know, I love Kerry. I think she's an amazing woman. And in the end, the Republicans may end up with a couple great choices for uh, Senate. I think uh, ultimately that's what you want, uh, is you want to have be able to have the voters be able to choose who they want. And I hope that, uh, you know, I would love it in a perfect world to be the only candidate, but I'm not sure that's how it's going to work out. Okay, you had been very, very involved early on in Stop the Steal. Given the evidence that's come out about the election, and I think you've even softened your position and you've said you think Joe Biden won. Am I correct? Well, I mean, I don't know what the opposite of winning is. I, I guess if, if somebody is not in the presidency, then you have to say that Joe Biden won. I mean, it can have some question marks next to it. But uh, I mean, I don't think anybody's going to argue the fact that he was the winner. He's, in, he's sitting in the White House. Are you, are you as hardcore on this idea that, that the election was manipulated in some way? Or has, as evidence has come out, are you seeing things differently? So I've been an election integrity guy. I've always heard the cries of the public. You know, there's a lot of people, 50 to 70 percent of the people are coming and saying, look, we don't trust in the elections. And so what I have tried to do is be an election integrity guy. Um, where I thought there was smoke, I looked for fire. Um, I got involved with some of the groups that were actively out saying they had evidence. I, uh, to this day, I've never been provided any evidence of significant material fraud. And so in my business, I don't have the luxury of going off of accusations or, or what might or happen. I have to live in the world of what you can prove and what you can take in front of a court and a jury and prove beyond a reasonable doubt. And I can say, John, that I have not received enough evidence or any evidence of material large-scale fraud. So those are really where I'm at. I'm an election integrity guy. I want to make sure that our voters are comfortable with elections moving forward and give them the, the no, let them know that they have a sheriff who stands up and believes in protecting our, our elections. Sheriff Lamb, again, um, deepest condolences to you and your family of the loss of your son, your future daughter-in-law, your granddaughter. That was just a horrific tragedy and, and um, our sympathies go out to you. 
Thank you, John. I appreciate it. Sheriff Mark Lamb. We're back in a minute on Newsmaker Saturday.